I'm always happy to talk with you. Uh, let me start by saying uh, I'm really happy the film was made. I'm so happy when more representation gets out there. Uh, so I really do hope it's a huge hit for you guys. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, so I have a, a ton of questions, but I have to start with, for me, uh, might be one of the most important things, which is um, what is actually happening with Super Troopers 3 Winter Soldiers? We have written draft seven. And so when we get to about draft 20, we'll, we'll start the machine up. Is it, does it really work like that with you guys? Yeah, I mean, we wrote 32 drafts of Super Troopers 1, and we wrote 30 drafts of Super Troopers 2. It's just our process. Um, but I will tell you this. We have a movie called Quasi, which we made. Uh, it's going to come out in December on Hulu, and it's a 13th century French uh, like murder, assassination, mystery. I play the King of France. Paul Soder plays the Pope, and Steve Lemmy plays a hunchback, and it's a big international sort of, it's like a, it's a Monty Python movie. Uh, I know Kevin directed that. That's right, British accents, the whole. I can't wait, number yeah. one. But number two, does, and I, do, I know my last thing on this, but does a lot change between like draft five and 15 when you're writing, or are you sort of just tweaking scenes, if you will? No, the five to 15, there, a lot does change. A lot will throw out entire plot lines and reorganize everything and bring back plot lines. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a process, but eventually we get there. Uh, you've directed a lot of TV. Yeah. And I'm just curious, what is it like for you stepping into the different, because every show has its own aesthetic and its own way of doing things. What is it like for you as a director when you're stepping in on, say, Resident Alien or some of the other things you've done, trying to sort of, you know, hit their thing, but also make it your own? Well, I just directed a show with Rob Lowe called Unstable, which is a new Netflix show that he and his son are doing, John, John Owen Lowe. Um, and, you know, I, I watch their pilot and go, okay, I get, I get which lenses they're using and they seem to want to use a lot of two shots. And, and then I sit with the, 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 the head writer on set and we shoot the show and I, and I say, you know, if I were working for another company, I would shoot a bunch of singles here. He goes, I'll never use them. And I say, okay, so I'm going to make these two shots perfect as though I would have the singles. And it's about rhythm, you know? It's about taking out the pauses. It's about pausing when you're supposed to. And for me, comedy is entirely about uh, pace, rhythm and pace, rhythm and pace. And, and luckily, the, the uh, Victor Fresco, who runs that, that show, agrees. Uh, jumping into why I get to talk to you. Um, what was it about this material that said, oh, I, I want to be involved in this? Well, I'm a Joe Coy fan, and it was his first movie, and he'd never acted before. And they said, can you kind of go up there and make sure we end up with a good movie? Uh, and I, you know, and, and I, it's, to me, it's important for Joe to succeed, like, because he's so successful as a stand-up, I'd hate for him to have a situation where, you know, he came into a movie and it didn't quite work out. And so I'm a stand-up, he's a stand-up, so I said to him, we got to make a really funny movie because people are going to expecting it to be, be, you know, they're not like, hey, Filipinos are in it, it's great. They're going to they're gonna want it to be a really funny movie. And then we'll also have all these Filipinos in it. And then that part will sort of advance the cause. And so we agreed to just make sure we've made like a, you know, full on funny movie. I feel like the last few years, there's been more representation in Hollywood, at least not a ton, but more. How do you look at it in terms of what's been going on the last few years? I think that, you know, representation is sort of a step-by-step -step thing. There was a point where, you know, it used to be the immigrants were newer, and so more of the characters had sort of their accents. And it was played for laughs, right? I mean, but it doesn't mean that was a bad time or that was wrong. It was just the way it was, right? I mean, there was a point where they used to put Indian, they played white guys in brown face with Peter Sellers. It wasn't wrong. It was just the way it was. But it's we're progressing, right? Now here I am. I've directed this movie with like a largely Filipino cast and a couple Indians, and it's like it's progress, right? So, you know, we got to kind of give ourselves a little bit of a break here. You know, like like they will look back on this time period in 2040 and go, oh, they were racist and they didn't do enough of this. And it's like, okay, well, I don't judge. I don't judge uh, the the. The past by the futures, uh, but but I don't judge the past by the present's new rules. 
So I think we're making great progress. I mean, you know, and I think the thing to look at is crazy rich Asians and how well that did. And you go, wow, that wasn't just Asian people going. I mean, it was all sorts of people were in that audience. And, and, and it worked commercially. And so if you work commercially, the reason Easter Sunday got made is because Crazy Rich Asians did so well. And if this movie can do well, then more movies will get made because of the business part of show business. That is literally the reason I'm sitting in this room wanting to help you promote this movie, because I want more representation in Hollywood. And the truth is, it'll only happen financially. When they make money, Hollywood will say, we can do more. As they should. There's a, these are expensive films. You don't just get to have a movie because you're of a certain race. It's just not how the system works. Uh, you made me laugh in the movie with the lines about, I'm losing you, the reception in the canyon. Um, when did you realize you wanted to play the role, and who came up with that uh, specific joke about you know, the agent? Well, like when I signed up for the movie, the first thing I, the first thing I don't do is say, hey, I want to be in it. Because I, I, I want to be <laughs> hired as a director and not, there, I don't want people to think, ah, oh, he's going to shove himself in it. So luckily, while we were casting, in order to come up and play that role, which was a two-day part, you had to quarantine for 14 days. And, you know, we went to some famous people, and they're like, I, I can't come up there and sit in, a, in an apartment for 14 days just to work, too. And I was like, all right. And so over time, Amblin was like, look, if no one comes up here, you're playing the part. And I was like, hey, you know, if you need me, I'll play the part. I'm here already. It's up to you. I'm not advocating for myself, for sure. And it came down to it. They're like, will you play the part? And I'm like, of course I'll play the part. And then the joke itself, the main joke, which is that my character keeps hanging up on Joe Coy because he pretends to be going over Mulholland. The, what the, the, one of the writers, Kate Angelo, is convinced that her agent sits at his desk and pretends to be on Mulholland and hangs up on her. Tiffany Haddish is very, very funny in the movie. There's a great scene with her at the car. How much is that sort of scripted? How much is that of uh, them finding it in the moment? Can you sort of take me through that? Well, she came up, because of her close friendship with Joe Coy, they were, they, they were teenagers doing stand-up together. She... Tiffany would take care of Joe's baby when Joe would go and do his set and he'd come back and she'd be changing his diapers. So there were, she worked, I think, three days on the movie and she came up in quarantine for 14. And she's such a big, famous, talented star that we made sure that we wrote her uh, uh, a, a lot of, of, of what I think are like really high end jokes. And so, so we wrote this scene, and I'm like, if you only say these jokes, I can pretty much guarantee that this is going to work. And of course, it's a cop pullover, and I've shot 20 cop pullovers. So I'm like, I got that part. It's more what, you know, the shape of their relationship and what the jokes are. And so we wrote her a bunch of great jokes. And then she and Joe spent about five hours the night before she came on set, and they just created all sorts of little riffs and riffs off the jokes and, you know, but they riffed within the structure of the scene. And so when I got there the next day, they're like, we got these five riffs. I'm like, what are they? And then she'd tell me, I'm like, yes, of course, sure, of course, yes, let's shoot them all. And so we shot all these little riffs and then, you know, between, I've done a lot of improv and Tiffany's done, you know, and so we just would improv with like a, like a cap on it. We'd just sort of be very structured and, you know, that sort of riff she does about, naming the baby Subi, you know, instead of not Mercedes, not Lexus, not even Tesla, not Tessie. Like, that was all her. But it was like, you know, she did it once, and I'm like, go with that thing. And then she would go with that thing. But yeah, she, you know, she improvised a good number of great jokes. What was it like for you in the editing room uh, in terms of when you have comedians that are delivering possibly a great alts? What is it like picking and choosing what you actually want to use? Well, I like it because I get to choose, right? And so I just pick my favorite. Uh, and, and you know, sometimes I'll cut something, you know, that I, I wasn't so sure about. Like, I wasn't sure about Joe kissing Lou Diamond Phillips' fingers. And then somebody way at the end of the process was like, what about that thing where he kisses his fingers? And I'm like, we really want to do that? And they're like, yeah. We're like, okay. So I cut it into the movie, and we showed a crowd, and they roared. And I'm like glad you said so. 
that leads me to my next thing. Uh, talk a little bit about what you learned about the movie from friends and family screenings and test screenings that like impacted the finished film. Well, uh, you know, they they first of all, the movie got good laughs, right? So we were we were relieved uh, that we were going to be entertaining. Uh, and second of all, it felt like um, people connected to the concept, which is a big concept of having a. a a family and weird uncles and ball breaking mother, and they were kind of like, this is sort of a pretty universal uh, dynamic, uh, and that was that was nice to sort of see because those, I mean, when you decide to make a movie and you're involved in writing the script, you're really just trying to say, I believe this is the way it should be, and I'm going to prove it to you, and then you see the audience react and you go, see. And and I know that's like cocky and whatever, but that's all we're doing. I mean, you know, the show part of of show business is show showing up. Uh, and 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 we we were happy that that the theory we had was proved correct. You obviously were not making a Marvel movie. You had a budget that you needed. You know what I mean. Yeah. And so I'm curious, what was uh, the toughest stuff? The things that you were most nervous about being able to pull off with the time and budget that you had. Well, the the big the big family scenes require everybody to know their lines, and luckily everybody did, because if they do, then you can really get good stuff. Otherwise, you're just desperately trying to catch up and running behind on time. So that was very important. And then the, you know, the car chase, I, I've shot a lot of car chases from Dukes of Hazard, right? So I knew how to shoot this, but I just wanted it uh, to be, you know, like we had much less time and many fewer cars. So it was a much more of a, a high wire act just to get what we got, which I'm thrilled about, but it could have gone wrong if it rained, you know? Completely. Yeah. When you are directing, do you typically look for, do you expect to do like say three takes, four takes, five takes on a scene? How are you thinking about it? Or do you, you know what I mean? Like how do you like to work on set? I shoot uh, a, one take of the master and then maybe a second take because there's only, only, there are only sections of the master that ever appear actually on screen, which is the beginning and when somebody walks across a room. Then I try to really hone in on the two shots because the two shots are where the actors can create their comedic rhythm. And if they keep the pace up enough, I love to use two shots because they're, they're just, you know, there's some Joe uh, Eugene Cordero two shots that I just kept long, six lines, eight lines, and just let them be funny within it. But, you know, I, I kind of, I'll shoot four or five of those two shots, and then I'll, I'll make sure that the singles are delivered absolutely perfectly so that I can always go to them if I have to. Do you typically like to use um, one camera, two cameras? Are, are you ever shooting multiple cameras when you're doing a comedy? I'll shoot, I'll shoot two cameras um, most of the time. Uh, if the DP is like, I can't quite light it properly if I, if, with the second camera, let me forget it. Three cameras is hard because you have to look at three images on the monitor and you can't do it. Like two, you can kind of, you can kind of see two things at once. You kind of flick back and forth. I do occasionally shoot three cameras if it's like, you know, in the church scene. We, you could put another, you could put a third camera in there and it wasn't going to get in the way. You know, in the, in the picnic, uh, scene, I put a third camera because you're outside and the lighting is a little easier to manipulate that way. Uh, you've directed all sorts of stuff. Is there a genre or type of project that you've always been looking to do? And I know it's a little generic and you probably get asked this before. I have but, the answer. But I want to know it. I want to make a um, like a modern 80s style cop buddy movie uh, that is super funny and also violent and the stakes are real. I want to make something in the world of 48 hours, but I want to do it transnationally between New York and uh, India. I like this idea a lot. You've obviously thought about this for a little bit. Do you have like a script in mind or this is I've just- I've written about 35 pages of a script. I just haven't uh, been able to focus because of Super Troopers 3 and some other things. 
I understand. I, and I also want, as getting back to the beginning of the interview, I really do want the Super Troopers 3 as a fan. It's um, going to happen. I, I really hope it does. Um, on that note, I'm out of time. I'm just going to say I really wish the, I really hope the film is a huge hit for you guys. Thank you. And uh, I look forward to helping you promote the next uh, Broken Lizard thing later this year. Thank you. I will also tell you, I, I built an app called Vouch Vault. Vouch Vault, right? And it's designed to be the Instagram of recommendations. And it's... For movies and TV or for... for everything. Okay, got okay, it. Okay, but the... the the genesis of it was my uh, rage against Rotten Tomatoes for the 36% fresh rating we got for Super Troopers from 90 critics, uh, when, in fact, 250,000 civilians gave it a 90% fresh rating. And I was, like, steamed. And I'm like, who are these? Critics are just strangers. And I'm like, when's the last time you walked up to a stranger and said, hey, what movie should I see? Now, I'll say this about critics. I, they have seen great movies, and they, they love movies. And so I want to know what they love. Right, so if if you go to M Vouch Vault and you sign up, you follow me, you'll see that I love Reservoir Dogs. You'll see that I love this book uh, about New York City, the epic of New York City. You'll see that I love this Italian place in 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 Hollywood. You'll see that I love the Tesla car, the golf clubs, this podcast. It's just the stuff you love, just the stuff. And if if you follow in me and you see something you haven't heard of but sounds intriguing, you push a button and it goes into your Tri Vault. So on a Friday, when you're like, what should I watch? You have a whole bunch of things in your tri vault, like The Offer or... or so that's, that's interesting, does it cor if you don't mind me asking. Does it correlate? So it's sort of like you're picking from individuals, and is, or is there also a way of, of you know, bringing a lot of recommendations together? Well, initially, it's individuals. The best way for you to join is to join with two or three friends and be like, the sushi restaurant's great, and you know, like, or, or you're going to Paris. Well, I, I put in this Paris bike trip, you know, like, but, or if you follow celebrities or, you know, influencers, or whatever, you like them already, so you kind of listen to their tastes. You know, Maria Menounos recommended a bag that's on wheels, right? Sure. So it's like, it's it's really that. But eventually, as we get the numbers up, it'll will tell you, hey, you know, you pair. There's an Australian in Sydney who, and you have 80% agreement on these things, so you might want to look at the other 20%. You might find some things you might like. Uh, I completely understand what this is now, and I will be happy to put it in the uh, help you promote it. I'd appreciate it. I can definitely handle this. Thank you. On that note, uh, I really do wish it's, I really do hope it's a huge hit for you guys. Thank you.